My name is Mike Marn. This is the Boomer Movement Network. Uh, this is a program where we're going to talk to people that maybe impact those of us that are baby boomers. People that influenced our lives or entertained us or what have you. And I have sitting here with me Monty Moyer. If you don't know the name, you will know who he is because he's in the group The Time from the whole Minneapolis Sound era, uh, the Prince era, and that sort of thing. The thing about Monty is that I've known Monty a lot longer than when he was in the time or from that whole era because Monty lived across the street from me and I gotta be honest with you Monty all that time you lived across the street from me I had no idea that you even played an instrument let alone in a band you were so quiet about this stuff what was going on when you were across the street and we were building snow forts and stuff you know probably when I met you when, when we lived across the street I was probably in my hockey mode so I probably wasn't playing too much music at the time but I always played but it was, it was more Tell me how it started that you got into music. I started in junior high. We had a little neighborhood band. Started out playing guitar. Took some guitar lessons. My folks got me a guitar. And we started a little neighborhood band. Played for a couple of years. But, 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 but then, but, but how you ended up, which it seems interesting to me, is because here you are, very quiet white guy, living in white bread, South Minneapolis where we live and you end up in black music R&B bands how, how, did, how did you make that transition from playing the little the little band that you were into all of a sudden being in the midst of a whole different world well it became when I was in college uh, a couple of buddies of mine David Island Tom Lund used to play at one time or another in a band called Flight Time which I think a lot of people have probably heard of local band and uh, one infamous night, you might say, that half the band didn't show up and Tom had called me to go sit in with him because he was going to go sit in because they needed some, basically needed some bodies. So I went in and sat in and Terry, asked, Terry Lewis asked me to be in the band that evening. And I played in that band for about an hour, or hour and a half, about a, a year and a half. And uh, out of that band, be, uh, the time was formed, the ba basics, folks. Now when the time was formed, that was pretty much at... at uh, Prince's direction. Yes. Now, when you met Prince, did you have any idea what you were dealing with at that point? Because he wasn't the big superstar uh, at that point. No, I just knew what I'd heard through through the guys in the band. Cause some of those guys had grown up with him, and uh, what he had always told Terry is that he was going to get a record deal and get his thing going. Then he would come back and get us and help us out. And sure enough, he did. You know. Well, w when this all happened and Prince hit and all the things were happening, I was working with a recording studio on a totally different level than you were dealing on. Uh, but it was crazy in this town. What was, your, what was your perspective in a band of note in a town that was just exploding as far as attention and talent coming out of it? It had to be a crazy experience for you. It was kind of crazy. It was even it was more crazy in other cities though because you know we weren't getting played here and Prince wasn't getting played here at least on there until Prince hit with uh, probably Little Cor Little Red Corvette or Delirious he right. wasn't getting played on any major radio here so people knew who we are who we were in this town but in places like Detroit or, or LA New York and that you know they had black radio so there was we were playing play regularly on the major stations, so it was a whole different deal. In the I think cities. I heard you say one time that kind of Detroit was the Times town. That's where you and Prince. Well, Prince is Prince is the Times. Yeah, that's where you were got the best reaction. Yeah, there was a guy named Mojo, a, a DJ, who started playing our first single, "Get It Up," about a, uh, and he played it for about a week and wouldn't tell anybody who it was. And of course, it had some similarities to Prince, and so people thought it was Prince, but then they weren't quite sure. And Prince wrote the song. Prince wrote the song, and but uh, this DJ Mojo really helped launch our radio career in that sense, because from that, from out of Detroit, and it was a little different back then. That song just blew up. Well, let's talk about the departure. Everybody knows the famous story of Jimmy and Terry leaving the band. Uh, because they were supposed to show up at some show and they were down producing some SOS band uh, in Atlanta or something like that yep. and the snowstorm hit they couldn't make the gig and uh, they got fired they got fired that they got fired at the end of the tour 
This okay. was about okay. in, I'm going to guess, February this happened. Roughly, and I think we were done by April, May, something like that. And as soon as the tour was over, they got... So when Terry, Terry and Jimmy left, you left too at that time, or did you wait a while? Uh, I left about a month after they left. And it was, a, I, 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 they had, I think they had gone to one of the rehearsals for Purple Rain, and I left after that. But you, you, you weren't in the movie Purple Rain? No. You had left by that time? I had left, yep. And they had the replacements there and, and such. Okay, so then then you went off to work with Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam. Yeah, I, I didn't know what I was going to do after that. I just, for many reasons, left left the band. and So I went home and just wrote songs for nine months. I had a little four-track recorder and just wrote a lot of songs. And Flight Time, Terry Lewis, Jimmy Jam were getting a lot of work. And they had so much work they didn't know what to do, so they... Uh, he had heard some of the stuff I, Terry Lewis had heard some of the stuff I had recorded and asked me if I wanted to uh, help them out, do, do it, not help them out, but but produce some stuff under their umbrella. Okay, so you were there for a short time, mm -hmm. but you, you did some significant stuff while you were there. What yeah. were some of the things you wrote or produced? Uh, with Janet Jackson, Pleasure Principal, Alexander O'Neill, if you were here tonight. Uh, uh, during that time, who else was going around? Uh, Patty Austin. Uh, Thelma Houston, it was probably 10, 12 acts I probably worked with. Okay. And at that point, after a year or so, there was a breaking apart between you and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. What was your plan then? Uh, just to keep producing. Okay. And and I, I after a period of time of trying to work out details of to to move on from that deal, I, I produced for a good five, six years. You did... You did a fair amount of stuff in Europe too, right? Yeah, I worked with a lot of English artists. Okay. Oddly enough, I'm getting a lot of calls. So you do that for a time. Mm -hmm. I'll tell folks too that Monty even produced a uh, uh, a song for an artist I was representing, a guy named Jerry Hubbard. The song called "Somebody's Crying" it was being done by um, <laughs> I can't think of the name. Who is it? <laughs> Force MDs. Force MDs. I'm sorry. And uh, the record company executive Monica Lynch said to me. Uh, yeah, your guy can't produce it. Pick a pick a producer. Well, Monty's the only producer I knew at the time, <laughs> to this day. And so I said, "How about Monty Morris?" She says, "Great, let's do it." And they did. You were away from the time. And now all of a sudden, you're back in the time. How did that happen? Because you're touring now and have been for some time with Morris Day and the current group of the time. The, mo the modern version. Yeah, we've been doing this. I think it's about our 21st year. Really? With this version, we started in yeah the end of '95. I think uh, the time came back together in about '89. There were rumblings of uh, there was talk of doing a movie and it, doing a record, and it, I forget all the details, but it was Prince was also trying to get a movie together. And, and long story short, we ended up doing a, a record called Pandemonium, and we were in the movie Graffiti Bridge, and there was also a Graffiti Bridge record, and that's how we got back together. We stayed together for a couple of years, and that was up through 91, or I shouldn't say we stayed together for a couple of years, but we did a number of dates until we stopped again until 95. When and you've been doing uh, it ever since. Produce, uh, yeah. Some promoters had called us up about doing some things. I don't know how, how close of ties you had with Prince during this whole thing. I know Prince was pretty, like you said, singular and kind of focused on what he was doing. Um, what was your experience with Prince while you worked with the time? And what what was your uh, immediate reaction to the surprise announcement that he passed away? Going back to the early days, which would be 81 to 83 or 84 roughly, and I'd met him previous to that a little bit, but you know, he, he was uh, incredibly focused, hardworking, could be real hard on people, could be very generous. Of course, as we're younger, things are a lot different when we're younger, you know, we mature, we mellow out a little bit. And I think he changed a lot over the years, you know, he, he, as we all do. Um, but he, he worked as hard as, he worked us very hard, and but he taught us a great work ethic and what it really took to do good work. And I think that's what he instilled in all of us more than anything. 
when you heard that Prince died, obviously you, you weren't seeing him day to day. You weren't probably even connected because nobody really was. What was your immediate reaction to that? Were you surprised? Were you absolute shock? Okay. I had no idea. And all of us were just in shock. It just didn't. We thought he'd live to be a hundred. You know, he's one of those. I guys. think everybody did. Yeah, he seemed indestructible. I knew he was in some pain because he had some hip problems, and but we had no idea that he was maybe in the pain that he really was. I don't think anybody did. Sheila, you didn't. I. And I don't think any of us had any idea who was taking meds for it or anything, but we nobody really knew because he was pretty private about his stuff. But the nice thing I think for all of us, and particularly Morris, is that we Prince invited us to play out in Paisley uh, January of this year, and Morris hadn't seen Prince for quite a while. And you know they're chi they're really childhood friends. Him and Andre were very close as, as kids and. So it was nice that he had us out. It was nice to, for everybody to see him again, and it was nice that uh, you know it, a lot of us had had ups and downs with him over the years. And I won't say Prince and Morris were on the outs, but they they hadn't. Let's just say they hadn't talked in a long time, and they got to talk and have a nice conversation. And I think, fortunately, it was some good closure for Morris. I mean, did you notice that during that era? I mean, I think I think Prince cast pretty wide shadow do you think a lot of people struggle with that oh yeah some are some still are really I, and it's just amazing how you know the outpouring he had from the entire world I mean you've got the Superdome and the Eiffel Tower turning purple and it, that, that's it's what amazed me and I, I'm thinking Prince local guy maybe the country and stuff like that but when they started showing pictures of the Eiffel Tower purple and all these different places I'm going wow the impact this guy had was it's truly amazing. It's even more incredible because it's not like some guy just goes turns a light on. They have to go to the city council and say, hey, we would like to do this in honor. And everybody has to sign off on it. Everybody was signing off. It was purple everywhere. It was, it was incredible. Well, well, um, so let's talk about what you're doing now. You're still playing with the time. Yep. You're headed off tomorrow to another gig in Sacramento or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. Is that pretty much the, the plan for the near future, at least, for you to continue doing what you're doing? With uh, the time, with the time, yeah, that'll continue going as it as it is and has. I've also uh, been producing a lot more, writing a lot more. Um, um, we're trying, we're looking at with, with you, trying to get some more production going, and, and as well as I'm picking away at a record of my own that I've been working on on and off for quite a few years. So, and recently, you uh, were given credit on uh, probably the biggest hit record of the year, which was Rihanna's Work. Now, I've listened to that record. I'm 56 years old. I don't get it. But it doesn't <laughs> matter. It sold millions and millions of, uh, of, well, I can't even see records, downloads, CDs, whatever they're selling now. Yeah. What was your reaction to that, that, that whole thing when you found out that, that you were going to be included as a, and given credit on this record? And tell me how, how it came about, actually. Yeah, they, they, uh, they actually took a, uh, musical elements from a song I wrote 30 years ago, Alexander O'Neill, if you were here tonight. And so they gave me a credit, and they call it music interpolation. So I, I wasn't actually an active writer on that song, but I... I, I don't do know if it. anybody was. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. 19 of them. Yeah, right. So, so but it was, it was a great surprise and it came it seemed to come out quick and it went to number one quick and it, it you know and it stayed there for nine weeks in the on the hot 100 and 20, 12 weeks 9 11 12 on the R&B charts and I mean it's a it's a blessing I mean I, you know it's, things happen once in a while in your life and you, just, you, know, you make you say thank you and you make the best of it so that's what I'm trying to do right now keep watching us here on the boomer movement network uh, we'll be talking to Monty and, and a, a number of other folks that maybe impact those of us that are in the baby boomer, boomer era. So thanks for watching. We'll talk to you again real soon.